Hey gang, Shane Patrick White here with another edition of Beyond the Process. Today is part one of a two-part episode where I will be digitally inking a comic strip that I illustrated a couple of years ago. The idea was that I was going to create a Sunday comic strip and I was going to try to do it on a regular basis, you know, maybe once or twice a month or so. Uh, I never got around to doing that, but I wanted to break out Clip Studio and show you how I ink digitally. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the process. All right, so we're here today to ink a comic strip that I drew a couple of years ago in Clip Studio. I roughed it out, drew it in blue line, and now we're going to ink it in Clip Studio. Now, one of the things that I wanted to do was to create a Sunday comic strip based on this character from my teen years. And I thought this would be a great exercise also to show you how to do some digital inking. When using Clip Studio or Photoshop or any other tool for digital inking, it's good practice to establish a brush size in order to be able to split up the foreground, middle ground, and background. Now, I do that mainly because there is a trap in digital inking, which is the infinite zoom. If you keep accommodating for your zoom as you get closer and closer to the detail of the page, you will sometimes put in more detail than will show up in the final product and it'll take a lot longer to actually ink the page, which I found out on a job a few years ago when I worked on the Guar graphic novel. In this case, uh, for the foreground, I'm using a 25 pixel brush. And what I'm doing right now, this shot is kind of a medium long shot. I'm judging what that brush is going to do in regards to the overall comic strip. I have to judge it against, say, a panel that has more of a close-up versus a panel that is a long shot with the character far in the background. Being able to establish these brush sizes will help you remember how to split up each of those viewing planes as you go through the page. And by comparing them, it gives you a sense of where the focus will be, whether it's per panel or in the page overall. So when you're laying out a page, one of the key components you want to consider is what is the page focus? In this case, the oval or the circular panel is more of a focal point than anything else. It creates a target sensation and targets are a very powerful uh, composition. So you can see here I'm inking the close-up and I've bumped up the brush to 30 pixels, which seems to be a pretty good weight to consider. And when it says 30 pixels, it means that's the maximum size when you push down the hardest on the brush. So when you go and use, say, the shift key to create straight lines, it'll automatically be a pure 30 pixels. And sometimes when you're using that for construction, you have to take the brush size down a little bit because I have to anyways, because that is usually a little too large for what I intend. Because I'm not pushing down the brush to get the maximum size overall. There's a lot more play between what your brush setting is and how hard you press on your stylus. One of the really important things in terms of inking, whether it's traditional or digital, is the spotting of blacks. You get a lot of mileage out of finding areas of black for you to direct the eye, as well as to give weight to the panel or the page in general. 
This helps set up framing devices. It helps lead the eye. It creates a sense of rhythm. And it's one of those things that I am constantly learning on my own. I'm, I'm looking at masters who are guys from the copper and, and bronze age before digital coloring became a thing. And it's a little bit of an older technique, but it doesn't mean it's invalid. In fact, it's probably one of those foundation skills that most comic book artists should really keep in mind. I think Will Eisner was probably the godfather of spotting blacks and using uh, black as a, as a way to shape an, a page. I think a lot of his influences were film and cinema at the time. But some of the comic book artists that I grew up with that I enjoyed a lot who were great at it were not always just pencilers, they were also inkers. So guys like Jack Kirby was very good at creating these very graphic shapes, but his inkers like, uh, I don't know, Frank Giacoya or, um, geez, who, who, oh, Mike Royer, he's another great one. Joe Sinnott is very good at spotting blacks. Gene Colan is a, both an artist and an inker. He did a, a marvelous job. But for me, I've, I've always looked back towards the godfathers of, of comics and comic strips to really guide the way a lot of these tools in comics are used. And when I say tools, I mean there are tools within the paradigm of comic creation that makes comics unique. So when working with line, especially weighted lines that have a little more bounce to them as opposed to the deadline of say like animation, it gives it a lot more life. So in the instance of this white water that I'm inking, there is a sense of freehand movement, movement that gives the splash feel more splashy. When I'm typically inking anything else, I have the stability cranked up a little bit. So when I pull the lines, they're going to be a little more smooth, a little more controlled. But when it comes to splashes or fur or feathering, I take the stability off and, and go a little more freehand. Always keep in mind that you can ink the negative space, like in the shoelaces, versus the positive, which is the shoelaces themselves. So the, the space between the shoelaces can give you a different look. And if you fill in the line work underneath the, the lace to give it a shadow, that sort of gives it a little more dynamic look to it than, say, if you were just tracing lines, as it were. I also use the lasso and bucket tool to fill in blacks. It's a lot easier than scrubbing it in with, with a brush or, you know, increasing the brush size. Sometimes I also will go in and I'll write down the brush pixel size on the panel. That way I understand or remember, uh, well, I might, I might forget, but I, I write it down so I don't forget what I used for whatever panel I'm working in. So if it's a close-up brush, I wrote down 35. If it's a medium-sized brush, I wrote down 25. And this really helps as I get further and further along, especially if I'm working on a multi-page comic. With a comic strip like this, it's not as hard to remember. Now you see the sea foam that I, I inked, I wanted it to have a, a more of a fluffier feel. So I kept it freehand, less stability, but I made sure that it felt different than the splashes that were a little more sharp than, yeah, than what I intended. One of my favorite things to ink are rocks. Rocks are just, I don't know, there's just, I can get lost in, in the noodling and the detail. And one of my favorite artists who, who does incredible rocks is Jack Kirby. He, he has a way of making the rock feel chunky, feel weighted, feel 
dangerous. There was a, a few years ago when my wife and I went out to Zion National Park and on our way back to Nevada to return the car and take our flight back to Seattle, we passed by a bunch of rock outcroppings that looked exactly like the way Jack Kirby drew rocks. And so I'm hanging out the window and I'm photographing everything I could just so I had the reference when I got home. But somewhere along the way, I lost that reference and I don't know where it is. And I don't know the location of where we were driving. So I think we're gonna have to make another trip out there. Another thing to keep in mind, for instance, when you're rendering clouds or anything for that matter is to make sure that things differentiate themselves from each other. You know, we sometimes have to pull reference to make sure that we represent those objects in the best way we can. A good sense of knowing the difference between say a rock and a cloud is how those lines or how the texture describes them. In this case, if you look at the cliff in the background, the line weight will tell the story of how far away that object is. And texture can do the same thing. So the further away from something, maybe the less texture will be noticeable and the more generalized the description will be in how you ink it. Sometimes I'll click the uh, pencil layer off or the blue layer, just so I get a sense of how things are working together. One of my favorite artists who does some really nice clouds back when I was growing up was like John Byrne. I also like more illustrative artists like Barry Windsor Smith or Alex Raymond or a host of other people like Hal Foster who did the Prince Valiant comic strip. They did gorgeous cloud work. And what's nice about when you look at other artists like that, it gives you a sense of a point of reference to figure out how did they solve that common problem? How did they approach describing those objects, those elements that live in the real world? Now for the clouds in this instance, I think I, I brought the uh, brush down to about 10 pixels. And in that first panel, you can see there's, a, just with the line work alone, there's a lot of depth. It's gonna come in handy when we color it later on. But for now, creating a sense of rhythm with line is, is a good thing. Being able to separate objects from one to the next is great, as much as it is to separate the planes of the illustration. Rhythm can also be found using shapes like these seagull that I have in the scene, for instance. The repetition of shape or the repetition of motion can carry your eye throughout a panel or from one panel to the next or throughout an entire page. So keep that in mind when you're designing your pages or penciling. Look for opportunities to carry over graphics, graphic ideas or or designs so that the page is more interesting and keeps the viewer's attention. Because really that's what we're fighting for these days is to keep the viewer attracted to the page and to keep them paying attention to the story. That's what I like about penciling and, and inking comics is that when you're working from a script, whether it's one you wrote or one that somebody else wrote, you're plussing the story and new and interesting ways. You are telling the story visually by seeding ideas. You're seeding icons or elements of graphic intrigue that will help carry or, what do you call it? Um, telegraph where the story is going. And these are very, very valuable tools in, when it comes to storytelling. I like writers who trust that I can tell a good story, that they write what they write and they let me interpret it the way I want to. And they always seem to be pretty happy with that. 
they're kind of there to sort of guide me if I, if I get it wrong. But generally, they let me do what I do best. And if I have questions, I ask them. But generally, if they're good writers, it's all on the page. It's in the dialogue. That's where you get a lot of the sense of acting. And it's in the page or panel descriptions. Some writers will give you a panel by panel breakdown, while others will just give you a page description where it's up to you to break it down into panels. Back in the 70s and 80s, that was called the Marvel style. The, uh, I think it was developed by Stan Lee. He would just give these basic page breakdowns. Penciler would go away, would pencil it, send it back into the bullpen, and then he would write the dialogue that would sort of flesh out what was going on. But he had a loose idea of where things were going. <clears throat> I think a lot of writers at that time in Marvel, uh, in the Marvel offices were working that way. I'm not sure as much with DC. Like I said, I love doing textures and when it comes to a foreground object, I put as much texture in that makes sense to me and makes the panel interesting. When inking, I also try to keep the heavier line weight on the shadow side of all the objects. This will give weight to each of the objects and give you an indication of where the light is coming from at any given moment. Some inkers will actually outline all the objects on a page in order to gauge the overall line weights that they're going to use. And then they go back and they fill in all the details. That's not something I particularly like to do, but for me, I like to figure it out as I go. It's a lot more interesting to me. One of the things that I really enjoy about Clip Studio is that it, if you hit the C button, it gives you clear. It gives you an eraser using the same tool that you were drawing with. And I do erase a lot, but it, it also affords the extra depth in terms of your illustration to be able to explain things in white or, you know, without having to use white gouache or something, which in traditional medium, it, it just never looks as good or as clean. Another thing I like about Clip Studio is if I get a face wrong or I draw something a little too small, when I ink it, I can adjust it and bring it up to the right scale. For this face, for instance, it just wasn't working out as well as I had hoped. And sometimes I can flip stuff or repeat things, especially if I don't want to redraw something over and over again. Learning how to ink folds is, is almost as important, if not more important, than learning how to draw folds. Knowing how to capture that rhythm and understanding the seven folds that are available to us for us to learn is really crucial in making clothing believable on your figures. But that's more of a, a drawing thing that uh, I can get into at a later date. I took an eight week course on draping uh, drapery and anatomy of folds. And I'm going to share that with you at some point. Eight weeks is a long time. Hopefully I can do it in less than that. This is more of a, a medium shot. And when taking on something like that, I'll probably hit the middle ground as far as the brush size go. And it'll be like a 20 pixel brush. And I'm only saying that for this, this particular project. It may be different for other projects that I do. 
One of the hard things to do sometimes is to get hard surfaces to look hand-drawn, not so sterile. And so I like to crank the stability up from like 22 to 32 to get my ovals locked in, but I'll still use like the shift key to get a straight line. That way it holds it together without giving up a little, you know, without giving up that, that hand-drawn feel. And it's a kind of look. I'm actually going for a little more of a handmade look as opposed to something that's going to be very, uh, that's going to use a lot of guides. I mean, guides are good. It's a different look. If you want your stuff to, to have a very tight feel, it can balance nicely with organic shapes. So it's, it's just a choice that you can make. And at some point I can show you how to do that as well. There was a time long ago when I was uh, in art school, I had a friend who got in contact with a couple local artists. Well, they're comic book professionals. And one of them was named uh, Ron Friends. He was the guy who created the black and white Spider-Man costume. And apparently he had gone to our school at one point. So I saw them in the lobby and decided to stand by and listen to what Ron had to say to my friends uh, about his work, but he also shared some work that he was doing on Thor, I think is what he was working on at the time. And what he showed us was a couple pages, and one was a city scene that was inked by Joe Sinnott. And Joe was one of these guys who, fantastic artist, great penciler, great inker, but the the crazy thing about it was this entire cityscape was inked with a brush and no ruler. It was so clean. It was, it did not look hand drawn at all. And then I, at that point, I just couldn't imagine I would ever get to that level of skill of handedness that could get me to ink lines that clean. So flash forward, Sometime in 2005, 2008, I had a very similar situation where I had a city scene to ink uh, for a book called The Overman. And I thought about that. I'm like, well, let's see if I can do this without any rulers. And I did. And while it was not as nice as Joe's, it still had a really cool look to it. It, it worked out, you know, because of the way I handled the brush it was good enough to pass muster. So it's, it's interesting what we think is impossible today with perseverance and work will actually be more easily attainable in the future. It's just gonna, it's gonna take, take time and you gotta give yourself that time and dedication to do it. So like I was saying, my, one of my favorite things to ink are rocks, and I also like inking trees. A lot of organic stuff. It just depends on, on what the project lends itself to. It'll be what I choose to do in terms of style. Digital inking is something that I'm slowly getting into more and more because of the ease of use. I don't have to scan. I can just go from pencil to ink and color within fewer steps. But there's still something about it. I, I do miss traditional inking. And what's important is even though we have these tools available to us, we should never abandon traditional tools because what it gives us is a higher quality of control when it comes to whatever we come in contact with, whatever we choose to do. At some point in time, when you're later in your career, you might want to go back to painting. You might want to go and start doing traditional stuff and you won't have the same motor skills because you're 
Memory will be about trying to undo stuff or using the algorithm of stability to make the brush smoother. So if you can bring those traditional motor skills into digital practice you're, and bounce back and forth, you're going to be investing in your future for a long time to come. Now this figure is a little further away. It's got less detail and you want to make sure that the way you spell out the figure and its detail, you don't lose that character. You don't lose that silhouette. That's why character design is so important. You want to make sure that no matter what the lighting is, no matter what the distance is, you can explain it clearly enough so that the reader is never lost and can see that person in a crowd. And because this character is a spy on a island, he is alone. So there's not as much of an issue of that. Going back to texture, here's a, an example of a towel wrapped around the neck of our protagonist. And I wanted that towel to have rhythm and texture and and so I had to take the stability off the brush and be able to freehand it the way I do. Now you can also see that I'm using more traditional or classic feathering for to describe the, the shadows and the volumes. And it's a choice I made, you know. It's not very modern, but this is kind of an, a classic adventure strip. So that was the, the approach I decided to go with. Being able to tell the difference between skin and fur and towel and plastic, I mean, these are all really great skills to, to learn. And it's great to have those references available to you and to see how other artists have done it themselves. Because ultimately what we're trying to do is convince the reader, the audience that we know what we're doing, even if we don't. There's a certain fake it till you make it kind of thing, but you really want to do the, the legwork, investigate, figure out how to better explain something, practice shadow and light, draw from life, draw from life using ink, using a brush. These are all going to help your skill set when it comes to digital inking. It's helped me over the years and I still find a little bit of uh, a challenge in doing it, even though I've done it for as long as I have. It never stops getting old. There's always some new and interesting way to describe something. Some of my favorite anchors are guys like Klaus Janssen, uh, Tom Palmer, fantastic anchor inked a lot of John Buscema stuff and people who are primarily illustrators like Frank Frazetta, Al Williamson are, are fantastic people to study as well. Sometimes if I need to, I will make another layer and I will do line work or follow through and then I'll erase away what I don't really need or, or want and then I'll collapse that layer that way it's it's all sandwiched into one when I'm done but it's it's a good practice because layers are infinite you know and that pretty much does it I think it's a fairly well designed page fully weighted and it looks like it's ready for color. So thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. And until next time, see you later.